So it's 10 o'clock. Uh, good morning. Welcome to another edition of Fireside Chat with the experts. Uh, our host today is Carlos Valenzuela. Uh, my colleague, Carlos Valenzuela, is our VP of Engineering. Uh, he's been with us for uh, six years now, Carlos. Uh, developing no, uh, eight. Eight years. Uh, time goes by yeah. too far. So it's been with <laughs> us for eight years. And... Uh, uh, developing a whole series of uh, technologies from um, uh, actuators and how our machines move uh, all the way to the development of uh, deep learning and, uh, and, uh, and machine learning algorithms for uh, the inspection of uh, samples. So uh, the conversation today is going to be on uh, the autonomous extra inspection of medical devices, which is an area that uh, Carlos and um, uh, his team have been uh, uh, covering for uh, the past uh, uh, several years now. And um, uh, if you have any questions uh, for future ask, you can either uh, unmute, unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can type uh, the question on your uh, chat and uh, I'll go ahead and ask Carlos uh, throughout the presentation. All right, so on that note, uh, Carlos, it's all yours. Cool, all right. Well, you know, thanks everybody. Thanks, Dil, for the intro, and uh, um, you know, thanks for taking the time. You know, now that a lot of us are working from home, it's a good idea to, you know, kind of educate ourselves of, you know, new technologies and what's out there, so. Um, so I'll get started, you know, like Bill said, if you guys have a question, just feel free to just post it on the chat and I'll, and I'll try to answer it as briefly as we can. If not, you know, we can take it off, off the chat and, you know, start a new conversation. Let's see if I have control. Yeah, it's not clicking, okay. All right, so I, I do have a couple of slides just kind of on, whoop, it jumped. <laughs> yeah, hold on one second. All right. You, yeah, you can have control. Mm-hmm. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Are you in the first one? Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. If you need to change lights, because I'm, um, you know, bringing people in to the meeting. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just let you know. Okay. Again, go back. You skipped it. So sorry about that. All right. So yeah, I have a, a couple of uh, slides on the kind of the history of the company. Oh, again. So go ahead. Uh, you. All right. Yeah, you can go next. Next slide. All right. Yeah. So you want a history of the company? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. All right. Um, so, you know, we, we started in 2008 uh, that we were doing research for the government and uh, a lot of it was based on x-ray systems. And about a couple of years later, 2010, that's when I came in and we started focusing on, on, on x-ray machines for uh, consumer electronics or, and, and, and customers, not just government contracts. Um, we are technically the largest US manufacturer you know, a lot of people are still manufacturing in China or, you know, overseas. Um, we acquired one of the big, our, one of our biggest competitors in 2016, and that kind of grew our, our, our legacy, our older machines and our, and our service uh, baseline. So we have about a thousand machines worldwide. Uh, another big one, you know, in 2000, about 2018, early 2019, we became a Cognex and Fanuc PSI and ASI. Cognex supports us a lot with, uh, our, uh, with machine vision tools, barcode scanning, and things like that. And, and Fanuc's been an awesome partner as well with uh, robotics. So cobots and, and, and just you know, regular robots to move things around. Um, we have locations worldwide. So our Marcos is our main headquarters. Uh, Poland takes care of uh, Europe. Uh, Tijuana, Mexico, we have a, a sales and service uh, that takes care of Mexico and South America. Chicago and North Fork. Uh, they're just sales on the East Coast just to have a different time zone. Cool, next one. All 
All right, so th these are some of our partners. You know, they're some of the biggest in the in the industry. Like I said, Fanic, uh, Cognex, Hamamatsu and Barracks are more on the X-ray side. Adam Bradley for PLCs for automation. These are these are brands that people know and are familiar with, so they're going to be feel more comfortable working with it. You know, from a service and from a support standpoint. Good. This is our, our, our product line. Um, and, and for this presentation, we can think about this as maybe more of the, the shell or the baseline where our system's gonna go in. Um, you know, that's, that's basically the, the footprint essentially of what a machine's gonna look like. You know, if you're doing a, a very small implant, you, you don't need a, a fusion machine that's giant. You know, you might wanna stay in, the, in a cube or, or a prime that, you know, we, we have the flexibility to, to use whatever the customer's needs. Good. All right, so it, here's a quick example of how, uh, uh, you know, once I, I'm starting more on the technical side, how an, how an X-ray image is, is, is produced. You know, a lot of, if some of the people on the call are not very familiar with X-ray technology. Uh, we have two big components, which is the source and the, and the sensor. Um, as, the sample, in this case, a medical device, gets closer to the source, we are producing magnification. If we get farther, we are reducing it and increasing our field of view. If you wanna see more components of one device at one shot, then you have to get closer to the sensor. If you wanna zoom in and magnify in a very critical point, then you get it closer to the source. Um, and our you know, manipulation will take care of all that stuff. You know, if, it, if a robot can move it closer, an act, uh, a conveyor can move it away, all these little things happen. So, good. So on that, um, so you know, like I said, there's there's two key components and I talked about the source and detector. So the cabinet was the previous slide where we, you know, you saw our, our product um, product line, which is a, the cube all the way to the fusion, which is our bigger cabinet. Um, these are, these are leaded fully leaded cabinets, they're safe for operators. They, uh, they have all the tools that you need to uh, produce a, a machine. And the last point would be automation and software. What, what, what does your application require to become automated and autonomous? Like, do, you, do you require uh, machine vision tools? Do you require AI to move things around? Do you, do you need a conveyor, robots? Uh, a lot of medical devices are not there yet, so they, they, they use what we call software assisted um, applications where, um, where software kind of tells the operator, okay, I think this is bad, but you have, to, you have the final call. Uh, and that becomes easier for validation and things like that. Cool, next one. All right, here's, here's some examples of, of machines, of custom machines that we built. You know, this first case, we have a machine with uh, two conveyors creating a 90 degree turn, a lot easier for radiation exposure because it's not, as, it's not a direct exit, but mostly because of ergonomics. So if you see where the keyboard and the monitor stand, it's right next to the, to the person that's loading the machine. So they, they're just sitting there, they're analyzing the image, uh, and they're just loading samples. Very simple, it, it, the sample goes in, gets a serial number scan and it goes inside the machine and then comes out the other machine. Um, I have a little video of, it, of this later, but there's a reject mechanism inside that that product stays inside the machine and into a lock mechanism, a lock bin. So, you know, only authorized personnel can remove bad and, and failed product. Cool. Next one. All right, here's, here's more on the robotic side. So, so here we have an extra machine with a, with a robot inside. This is more for higher throughput. Uh, but a, a key thing with a robot is because we have full control of it, we can, we can create not only a manipulator, but we can create a sorting mechanism where maybe your product doesn't only have a pass fail. Maybe there's three or four different categories. So if you see on the right side, um, there's a robot moving around and it's picking up this device that it's x-raying and then and then sorting it depending on the status of that uh, current sample. It can be bad, good, marginal, too big, too small, uh, missing one piece. Because you know, to reduce scrap, 
you know, there, there might you might be only missing one device that you can push your product, you know, back a few steps on your production line and add that device that is missing. And you're you're basically reducing the, the amount of scrap. It's not just trash. And then we, this is, you know, kind of showcasing our, our, our expertise with, uh, with, with Fanuc. We're pretty happy with that. Um, then the next one is, is something more inline. All these three machines are, they all have conveyors. You know, the one on the left side, um, it's, a, it's our inline machine and then talks to other conveyors in a production line. So this, this, this machine can be, you know, one step of a, of a bigger process. Uh, you know, the, it can come from uh, optical inspection and then x-ray, and then it can go on to final assembly or whatever it is. Uh, you know, the one in the middle is, is it's, a, it's a conveyor. So it's meant, meant for bigger products, or well, at least that machine. Um, it has a larger field of view. Uh, so you can fit up to a 17 by 17 inch um, product x-ray. I mean, technically you could fit it even bigger, uh, but the field of view is 17 by 17. Uh, you can do a lot of processing and then, and then comes out. Uh, very easy to use. I mean, you can see that all of them have the keyboard, the tray, they're all touch screen, super simple. Uh, and then the one on the right, same concept, is just in a smaller um, footprint. All right, so, you know, why do we need to x-ray, you know, these devices? And I'll try to summarize all these points in, in, a, in just kind of a few sentences. So, you know, this is, this is, uh, uh, you know, things not change through the whole crisis and the pandemic and all that stuff. But, you know, every year our, our life expectancy is, is higher, right? People live longer, but they don't live longer just for, because they're healthier. They live longer because they depend on all these devices. You know, people with diabetes, AIDS, and all these uh, diseases or um, that used to be more, almost like a life sentence are not anymore. So they depend on on smaller uh, glucose monitoring systems. They rely on all these devices to live longer, essentially. So there's a high demand for these devices. And the complexity of these devices, because technology is so much better now, they're smaller, they're more efficient. I mean, if you see a pacemaker from 20 years ago, I mean, it's like almost you have to wear a backpack. Um, and now they're, they're tiny, you know, hearing aids are smaller and smaller, so they, you need new technologies to, to, to x-ray these components. Um, and then the other side is that you rely on people making these harsh decisions. You know, they might make the right decisions for the first 20 minutes, but then they might get tired and just start passing everything on, and, and things like that. So, you know, that's where the automation and the autonomy comes in. You know, we create an automated system to make it as efficient as we can, to make it faster, and the autonomy is that we, we give the system the tools required to make the right decision or, or kind of guide operators into making the right decisions. If they rely on, you know, putting a sample on, on, a, on an XY table and getting the, you know, the perfect angle, that's a little too much. So what if you put a robot and the robot gives you that perfect angle and the person, the only thing has to do is press a green or a red button. So, you know, there's, a, there's, there's not only, uh, there's a great area where, um, where we try to help the customers into making the right decisions. Cool. So you, here's some examples of, of how diverse medical devices can be. You know, we have you know, in the middle, we have a, a pacemaker that's complicated, it has, it has a battery inside, so the batteries have to be x-rayed. The bottom, we have a, a hearing aid, a, um, a uh, glucose monitoring system. And on the right, we have something more old school, a, a medical kit. Uh, even though it's still, it's still very complex, it still has a lot of parts. It's very important, but it's, a, it's kind of the opposite of the other ones. One's super you know, small and tiny, the other one's huge, but it still has you know, some complexity to it. And then, you know, I have some, exam some real examples of these. All right. Now onto some actual X-ray images. So you know, we wanted to start with something that everybody kind of kind of familiar with, which is a FP pen, essentially auto injector. Um, 
So you can see here, you know, very basic. You guys have probably seen it before. You can go to the next one. So that, that's what an x-ray of it looks like. Uh, you know, it could be simple, but there's a, there's a lot of places where things can go wrong. You know, things that you can't inspect optically. You know, you, you, we're kind of creating this, this uh, third dimension of, of, uh, of quality inspection where you can see through it after it's been finally uh, assembled. Go to the next one. All right, so here, here you can see in just an example, Uh, you can see an example of, uh, uh, of what a, uh, um, almost like a production line of, a, uh, of an inspection could be. It can be a conveyor and you have on the left side, the, the red device is the x-ray source and on the right side, the black little square is the detector. So we are penetrating the device and we're creating an image. Uh, this, this happens almost live, you know, one part every second or so, and it, it can be pretty, pretty fast. Uh, and you see a little little piston there that stops the product um, and then goes on to the next one and basically just keep moving along. Um, this is just kind of like a demo of how a production line can be created with our, uh, with our technology. So, next one. All right, so here we have three key areas for errors or for defects. We have a spring on the left side. We have the, the medicine or uh, what's gonna be Put in there it doesn't have to be a, an EpiPen. It can be whatever it is. And on the right side, another spring. Um, so if you go next image. So here you go. Three, three examples of how things can go wrong: uh, bent needle, missing uh, dosage, and a uh, bent coil. Um, so I have some example, some more examples of, of springs. But springs are very important in our medical devices because they. They, pro they provide the motion to your device. And that motion has to be repeatable and it has to, you got to count on it. If it's, if it's bent, you know, you know, we're talking about life and death kind of, kind of things. Um, cool, next one. Here, here's another example. Uh, you know, this one doesn't have the empty vial, but it has some big bubbles inside. Uh, you know, see some bu bubbles. And, and on the left side, you know, that's our, our algorithm counting how many coils that spring has. Um, and that a coil and a spring gives you the torque, you know, the, the repeatable action. Um, so, you know, if, if one has 13 and the next one has 12, it might not work the same way. So, you know, for an EpiPen, I think it's, it's more like a gross, you know, action, but for some other devices, you, 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 want, you rely on the action to be repeatable. Um, so, and, you know, we're good. Bill. So here's a um, here's kind of a video, just a, the, like a reject mechanism. So if we find a bent bent needle. Um, there's a there's an inspection area on the right side. We have a little piston, and if it's bad, it pushes it to a lock uh, bin under the machine, you know, somewhere where they can't uh, grab it. And then on the other side of the machine, there's a key where you open it and you grab a bad product. Hopefully you don't have to use that that often. Cool, next one. All right, so, you know, kind of talking about bubbles, you know, this is, this is just, an, this is an example of an implantable device. This, this goes inside your body and inside there's, there's, a, there's medicine, whether it's, you know, HIV prevention, HIV or medicine uh, or uh, insulin or um, human birth control, you know, whatever it is, you know, it's inside. Um, and if you go to the next one, Bill, here's a blown up image of it. And if you go one more, you get those huge bubbles. And you know, to, to the ones you see it, if you go back one, uh, they're easy to see, you know, they because they because your brain kind of got trained for it. Uh, but they're complicated to find and they are complicated to uh to locate, even using um uh, even using a computerized system like algorithms. There's not a lot of data there 
as far as, you know, on an x-ray image, we're dealing with black and white colors. Um, when you have a bubble, you have sort of little lighter colors, but not very much so. Um, so, you know, for, for, for bubble detection, we got to do, you know, things that are more complicated. And I'll go over an example. You can go next. Here's another example of more bubbles. Um, one more. So, you know, to kind of tackle the, the whole bubble uh, um, issue is this has been something that we've been asked uh, a lot about, but it's hard to kind of show examples when it's, you know, when it's an actual, an actual product, you know, there's NDAs and, and all this other stuff. Um, so we had this case study uh, a few years ago where we analyzed the contents of inject cartridges. Um, and if you, if you go the next image, next slide. Then. So here we have, you know, an example you want to put upside down. If you have any bubbles, you want it to kind of, you know, kind of locate to the top or cent centralize essentially. Uh, there, you can see the detector on the on the image on the right, and uh, and the source kind of closer to the bottom. Good. All right. So here we have two images. This is what an X-ray of an inkjet cartridge looks like. You see on the one on the right side and the one on the left side. There's something wrong with one of them. Um, and I guess if you go to the next slide, we'll find out. All right. There's a huge bubble there. Um, and you can see, I mean, there's, there, uh, there, it's kind of complex. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, internal uh, components to it. Uh, so finding a bubble, it's not just kind of finding it is it's training the system to understand what a bubble looks like. If you look in the image on the left, you know, there's a lot of differences in colors. There's there's some dark ones, there's some lighter ones, there's circles in the middle, there's all these kind of complex uh, things going on that the system has to understand almost what to look for. Uh, so this is where we implement uh, a deep learning approach where we teach, where we load data, take a lot of images, show what, an, show what a bubble looks like, and the system will start to understand. So if you go to the next one. So here, here's a quick example of, you know, on the left side, we got our data set. I mean, of course, the data set has to be a lot bigger than that. Uh, but basically, just showing the machine, showing our, our, our system, what are defects and then tagging them, this is bad, this is good and, and things like that. You know, if you see on the left side, you know, there's good ones or bad ones, you know, more, there's a couple in the middle that are good. You know, there's some have a bubble in the top, there's some that have a bubble in the middle. Um, and our computer analyzes them and then you see on the right side, we get three different results. We get one good one and two bad ones. Good ones doesn't have a bubble. And on the, you know, the, there's one that has a bubble on the top and there's one that has a bubble on the bottom. Um, and the benefit of this is that, you know, we're, we're training it on just locating bubbles. You know, this can be internal defects, you know, foreign material inside. It can be any, anything you want to look for. Because, um, you know, we hear the case like, oh, I can just weigh the, um, I can just weigh it. You know, if it, if it, if it matches the, what it's supposed to be, then it's good. But yeah, you know, that, that's, a, that's an easy, you know, simpler solution. But, you know, what if a bubble on the top is fine? What if it's on the bottom, it breaks your printer? You know, there's, there's it, it, you know, maybe it can uh, um, create clogs or, you know, things like that. Maybe one huge bubble is fine, but, you know, multiple little ones is, is, is the worst thing that can happen. So there, there's a lot of information you can get from, from, a, from a system like this. Hey, Carlos, we have a yeah. question from uh, yeah. one of our participants. So uh, uh, Jeff is asking, what is the process to understand if this is going to work for my product? So, you know, it depends on, on what the product is, but, you know, most of the time if we're dealing with complex applications, we do what we call a, uh, like a study where, you know, we all, we do as much as kind of both parties will feel comfortable moving forward. So instead of, you know, kind of designing a whole machine, you know, in, in, in a week, we say, okay, let's tackle on a couple of things. And then, and then, then they like it, let's, you know, analyze a couple of images. And if they like the results, then it's easier 
to kind of gauge what route to take. Is it is it just traditional uh, machine vision? Is it AI? Is it a robot? Is it you know all these things? Um, it's, it, there's no kind of clear answer, but it's it's mostly you know kind of be, becoming engaged on the product and understanding the product itself. Cool. Thank you. All right. All right. Here's here's a here's a video of a. Uh, um, of the system kind of uh, processing images. Uh, see, you know, some of them I, I, I remove the indicators. So you can see the indicators, you can remove them. Sometimes, you know, you, you'll uh, um, find a defect, but then you, you remove the indicator and you're like, oh, I don't think that's a defect. So that's when you have to go back and, and feed more information to the algorithm to understand that that not a defect. Or sometimes it's, it's proven to not be a defect anymore. You're like, okay, that's not a, uh, we're creating too many false positives. Um, so, the, you know, they, the, the, they get processed very quickly, you know, less than a second an image. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our processes are the fastest part of the machine. The slowest part is, is the loading, is are we relying on a person to, you know, physically grab it and put it in the conveyor? Are we waiting for something else? Are we waiting for a machine to finish what they're doing? So. You know we're we're pretty efficient on how we how we use time. Okay. All right, use another case study. This is kind of like a simpler one. So this is this is something that goes inside a, an infusion pump. It's some sort of device and it has a um, um, some tubing. So what was happening is that uh, the operators were kind of coiling this uh, this tube and then they're just packaging it. It'll go to and they'll sterilize and then and put on a box and just kind of sit in a warehouse till the customer wanted it. And you know, a few days later, months or even years, you know, the doctor would get it, open it, you know, bring the tube out, and they'll have they'll be bent, they'll have some kinks, and it'll prevent fluid from going uh, through it. You know, it could be you know IV, it could be blood, it could be whatever it is. Um, so you know, they had this huge lot of kind of compromised material. So, you know, there's no way that you can, you, you know, you open the seal, now you, now the sterilization is, is gone, right? So you have to re-sterilize it, so it wasn't worth it. Um, so they had this, you know, warehouse of hundreds of thousands of, of um, devices. So if you go to the next one, Bill, there you go. So now, now you can see at the bottom, there's a kink there. So that bend over there was bent a little too aggressively. That you know, maybe if you bend it like that and you open the next day, it's fine. But if it's sitting and it's hot and it's, you know, whatever it is, this, this uh, um, environment was creating these uh, bends to become kinks and then not be able to be used. All right, so next one, you know, another simple one. It's, it's a packaging of a, of a catheter. So, you know, catheter is a very simple device. It's, you know, there's not a lot to it as far as x-ray goes. Um, they go inside this metallic bag and that bag goes inside a box. So, you know, they had, they had some RMAs and they had some issues with them and they're trying to figure out what it was. So you go to the next image, so that's what, a, that's what an x-ray of a catheter is. And I mean, you can, my, you know, two-year-old son can detect what the issue with that is, right? So, uh, you know, if you go to the next one, uh, you can see that there's two huge bends. And, you know, the, the thing with this is that it, the, the problem was a machine, you know, a few steps back. So, you know, they were able to, oh, I know, I, I know exactly what machine that is. And they went and they tweaked it and it's fine. But, you know, our machines are creating this, uh, this uh, kind of closed loop system where, you know, you can create more data and kind of feed it back into becoming a more efficient production line. Um, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to x-ray things because you have problems. Maybe, you know, you have to x-ray things just to know more about your product and, you know, kind of find uh, problem sources or, you know, where, where problems can occur. Next one. All right. So, and, and another, another big thing on, on uh, medical devices is, is springs. Uh, so, you know, go next one. You know, we saw a few examples on EpiPen. Here you can see, you know, a couple of, uh, of images of springs and, you know, or, or if you see the annotations on the, on the numbers, we're, you know, counting uh, the coils that each spring has. If it's not 
you know, we see 10, but, you know, it counts zero, so there's 11 coils. If for some reason there was nine or, or, or 12, then, you know, that would fail. Next one. And then again here, uh, you can see, you know, just another picture of EpiPen, so you can see the springs, but, you know, examples of really, really bad springs. You know, the ones on the, on the left, they're like falling apart. Uh, and, you know, maybe they still work. Maybe they're just, you know, they were wound, you know, opposite and they're just, they're just look that bad, but you, you can't take the chances of, you know, having that on your product. Next one. All right, I think this is, this is a lax example, but this is, this is a pretty interesting one. So this is, you know, as when we started initially, we saw this picture of this medical kit and this medical kit can be, it doesn't have to be a medical kit. It kind of, it, I think it's just showing that the, our capabilities or our technology to analyze the finished product. Um, so go ahead, Bill. So that's, that's what the kit looks like. Um, next one. That's what it's in open. And of course we x-rayed it, you know, sealed and, and sterilized and everything. Uh, one more. So that's, that's an x-ray image of it. You know, we can see everything. You can see vials, you can see syringes, you can see the scalpel, everything. Then again, you know, this to explore the capabilities of, a, of, of an AI system, we had to create, a, a, again, a data set. You go to the next one. So here's an example of a bunch of different possibilities. And it, this became our data set, but also became our testing, like our, our control group, essentially. You know, we, if you see around, you you can see all sorts of different configurations. You can see, you know, scaffold around, the scaffold fell, and, you know, the vial on top of something else, you know, all these. So if you only care about your product being complete and fully sealed, uh, this is the right tool. But, you know, we also know location, we know orientation. So if, if, if your kit or your product requires a complete kit, but also to be placed on the same spot, then that, you know, this tool is right. So if you go to the next one. So here, here you can see, you know, every single component, you know, components, you know, component zero is the big syringe. Uh, one is the three vials. So our, our, our algorithm will be, you need one zero, three ones, three fives, and from there, you can easily, you know, find out if you have a missing component. Um, and of course, you can also find location and things like that. The next one. To see how, you know, things move around. And then the last one, you know, the last one's kind of interesting where we have, uh, where we have few devices, we have the scalpel that fell off. We have, a, you know, a vial, a syringe on top of the other one. You know, we have a very complex thing going on and it found every single component. So that's kind of the, the beauty of using AI, a traditional uh, machine vision tools like pattern or comparison wouldn't, wouldn't be able to get these sort of results. Because when we use AI, and I don't want to get too much into AI, uh, we are teaching what a, what a product is, but also what it's not. So it's understanding its environment, it's, it's understanding a lot of things. Machine vision will just re rely on what what am I looking for? But if it's on top of another one, it kind of changed, you know, what it's what it looks like. AI kind of understands more. Like, okay, if I if I'm on this side, I look like this. If I'm on that side, I look like that. So it's it's a deeper um, understanding of the product. And I think that's it. I don't know if you, who, four minutes too long. <laughs> You're muted, Bill. Do you want to tell us about your webinar with uh, Cognex coming up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, there's there's a couple of people from uh, from from Cognex that joined. They've been a awesome partner. Uh, so in a couple of weeks, I think the date's still to be determined. Uh, there's gonna be another webinar hosted by uh, by Cognex and, and myself, uh, kind of showing a lot of the same examples, but you know, kind of going technically more into the details of how you know some of them happen and how We've been working together, uh, not only just on on uh, on the X-ray side, but also you know the the, the barcode scanning and, and and things like that. You know, helping us automate uh, these machines. Right. 
Well, thanks so much, Carlos, for your presentation. And uh, uh, thank you all for participating in this uh, fireside chat with the expert. Uh, please uh, connect again next Wednesday at 10 a.m. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye. Play what you want.